see if you're watching from Facebook Live. Uh, hello, if you're watching uh, a little later on a recording, thanks for doing that. And if you're listening on the podcast, thank you for joining us there. Uh, today is a fabulous day, and the reason it is is because we have two incredible women that are joining us, and I can't wait to introduce them to you. But first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Kendra Kincaid. I am your host today for Airtime, uh, which, as I said, is a webinar and podcast series. Uh, it is brought to you by Elevate Aviation. Elevate Aviation is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to trying to get women into aviation and also support the ones that are already in aviation. And we do a lot of different things. Uh, we have uh, a mentorship program, both in the civilian and the military side. If you're in aviation and you want to be a mentor, or if you're looking for a mentor, you can contact us. Uh, we have a, a learning center with an incredible vision going forward. Uh, we, if you want to be a speaker in aviation, you can contact us and become a speaker. Lots of things. Look at elevateaviation.ca to uh, find out how you can get involved. The number one thing I wanna tell you about now though is we do have our second round of our leadership masterclass. There is a link in the chat. Uh, if it's not there, I'll put it in there. There should be a link in the chat now. Um, there are only 12 spots available. Last time they sold out in two days. We have not put it up for advertising yet. It'll go up tomorrow, um, but it's five different days of visiting with uh, leaders in the aviation industry on a private masterclass where you can really uh, learn skills and grow confidence to grow your leadership. So be sure to check that out as well. And again, if you need more information about it all, info at elevateaviation.ca is our, our email or elevateaviation.ca for our website. So moving on today, let's get started with our guests. So I am thrilled to bring you these two outstanding women in Canadian aviation. They are leaders in our industry. And even if you're listening from outside our industry, you'll take something away today because we're going to talk about their journeys and how they got to where they are. And hopefully you're going to take some of the lessons that they've learned and be able to implement them into your own life. So I'm just going to read their bios, a very shortened version of their bios, because if I read their entire bios, it might take the entire hour. They are so accomplished. Uh, the first one is Joyce Carter. She is the president and CEO of the Halifax International Airport Authority. She joined the Airport Authority in 1999, and since then, she has been an integral, integral in the growth and development of the organization. She became the CFO in 2006, the Chief Strategy Officer in 2008, and President and CEO in 2014. On January 2nd, during COVID, or I guess just at the start of COVID, uh, Joyce was elected as the chair of the Canadian Airport Council, and she was the first woman to ever assume that role. Tamara Baroum is the president and CEO of the Vancouver Airport Authority, and from 2007 to 2020, she served as the CEO of Van City Credit Union. Okay, here's the interesting part. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Tamara left Van City to accept a position as the president and CEO of the Vancouver Airport. So while most people were leaving, you know, unfortunately, and we'll talk about that, about a lot of people who are leaving aviation at this time, Tamara's coming in. Is she wearing her cape uh, and coming in as a superhero to uh, help the airport? We're going to talk about that. Um, she's previously served as British Columbia's first and youngest female deputy minister of finance and is the first woman to lead the Vancouver airport. Both my guests have won multiple awards and been recognized for the incredible work that they do in the community. And I can't thank you both for joining me today. This is, this is so wonderful that you both made time to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity and invitation. Yeah, it's great to be here. No problem. Okay, you guys, if you are watching, I just want to remind you, uh, feel free to ask some questions. There is a Q&A box that's down there. Um, you can throw your questions in there and we will try to get to all your questions. Don't be afraid. This is the time. Uh, we have these wonderful women here and uh, this is the time to be able to ask some questions, you know, especially if it's surrounding um, your leadership and and things that you would like to know and any this is a perfect opportunity to be able to ask some personal questions that uh, might be able to help you in your life as well okay so the first thing i want to find out about you guys is let's talk about let's talk about growing up so i'm always curious about people and 
the journey? Like, did you grow up one thinking that you wanted to be in aviation and two that you wanted to be a CEO? Uh, uh, Joyce, do you want to start? I will. Thank you. And I suspect our stories might be a little bit different, but um, I don't know Tamara well. I'm absolutely um, thrilled that she's joined YVR and is a member of our community. And I look forward to hearing your story as well, Tamara. Um, the answer to both of those questions would be no. So I did not grow up thinking I would ever work in aviation, nor did I grow up thinking I would someday be the CEO of really what is this wonderful facility. So if I am to think back about that time um, in my career, I am born and um, was raised in Nova Scotia. So small town community um, in rural Nova Scotia. I am the um, youngest of four in my family and my mom and dad ran a business in their home, actually a family business. We employed, uh, they employed a number of people in their community. And so early on um, as being the youngest, I got to see that and I got to, I think that's where I got my appreciation for running a business. Um, I always loved numbers um, and I always, um, you know, did well in math and in various science um, subjects in school. So my um, guidance counselor in high school kind of guided me towards that uh, direction and took me to a path that saw me study business. I had the interest anyway and eventually get my, my CPA, was then my CA and, and today um, is known as your CPA, my Certified Professional Accountant's designation. So appreciate the numbers. Um, when it comes to aviation, funny, funniest thing is as a very young girl, I thought someday I'd be a flight attendant. <laughs> so that's kind of funny when I think back. I did, lo I did love travel. And when I think about you know, being raised in this family that ran a business was really important in its community, um, employed a lot of people in the community. My family and parents kind of knew the importance of connections within the community and working together. Um, I loved numbers, loved, obviously, got directed into accounting, appreciated what numbers could tell us, always loved to travel. And so when the opportunity came up back in 1999, to work at the airport. I had had my designation. I had worked in various senior roles in the city of Halifax. I had moved to Halifax by that time and um, had, um, had worked in real estate. And I think kind of real estate is what got me in the door. I think the recruiter at the time, the airport still was run by, by Transport Canada and they were setting up the CEO and um, VP finance for the new organization. And um, I was contacted to see if I would like to uh, consider the role and I had no aviation experience, zero. So, you know, that's one of the first things I want to say is we're always sort of looking for experience in the business. Um, everyone has to start somewhere. And so I put my hat in the ring and was really fortunate to, to come into the role as uh, VP finance and really get to have a front row seat, you know, for the next many years uh, in terms of the CEOs I worked with, the great management team, the employees, and uh, shaped the future um, of uh, HIAA. And, and when the opportunity came to apply for the CEO, was really um, uh, happy to be able to do that and, and quite honored to, to get that role in 2014. So, so here I am today. Wow. Okay, we're going to dig into some more of that, especially like you know, um, the, the courage to apply on, on jobs and to go into industries that you hadn't been in before, because there's a whole bunch there that I want to touch on. Uh, Tamara, how about you? How did, how did you, where did you come from? You came from yeah, Vancouver absolutely. Island, I think, or, or where were you from? Yeah, I'm, I'm from British Columbia as well. Uh, so, so we're born and bred in the, awesome. in the, in the community that, uh, that, that I now, uh, that I now work in. And speaking of community, I am coming to you today, uh, from, uh, the West coast from, uh, YVR, uh, here on Sea Island, which is the traditional territory of Musqueam people. And, uh, YVR has a very deep and lasting partnership with Musqueam. We have learned a lot from the women leaders and elders in that community and just wanted to pay my respects to uh, elders past and present. And speaking of, uh, speaking of wisdom, Joyce has been a, a great uh, mentor to me in these past few months as I've uh, come into this role, the, one of the first people actually to reach out to me 
when it was announced that I would be uh, the CEO. So, uh, so her her leadership and walking the talk uh, absolutely has been has been experienced by me personally. So this is a great opportunity for me to thank you for that, Joyce. And in terms of my own uh, story, I actually um, I, I'm from uh, I'm from. Uh, uh, British Columbia, uh, born and bred uh, here, either on the coast or grew up, spent most of my uh, sort of formative years in the interior in Kamloops. And I'm the eldest of four children. And actually at a fairly young age, uh, just shy of my seventh uh, birthday, uh, my father was uh, killed in an aviation related accident at work. And he was a helicopter pilot and uh, he was uh, killed uh, while working as a helicopter pilot at Boundary Bay Airport uh, here uh, in the Lower Mainland. And so that had a very profound effect on, uh, on me and, uh, and my family. I had to grow up quite quickly, honestly. As the eldest of four, uh, we, uh, my mom had to take on multiple jobs. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money for a time. And, uh, and the thought of aviation was distant to me because it had had such a profound effect on, uh, on, on my family uh, personally. Uh, you know, it, it had a kind of a, uh, an okay, uh, happy actually ending in that my, uh, my mom remarried and, uh, and uh, my, my stepdad who's still alive and well, is, who's absolutely who I consider my father and all good from that point of view, uh, a lovely upbringing. Uh, a very uh, close family as uh, I think a result of, uh, of that early uh, challenge that we faced. I'm the first member of my family to go to university. And so uh, when I went to university, I just went with wonder and curiosity. I was lucky enough to get a scholarship. I uh, went, uh, went to the University of Victoria, mostly because I could live with my grandparents because we couldn't really afford to do it another way and they lived there. Uh, but had a very eye-opening experience about that there is so much more to opportunity and, and life than, uh, than maybe I had known or even than my parents had been able to provide for me, uh, even though they were very, very supportive and loving parents and still are uh, to, uh, to this day. Uh, and so I think that's when I really started to understand that, first of all, uh, life wasn't fair uh, when it came to women and uh, careers and history. Learned about the suffragettes and everything that they had to do, even just to get the vote. Uh, and that also education uh, and leadership could be uh, transformational. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm proud to serve as the chancellor of SFU University. I really personally, it had a huge effect. That opportunity had a huge effect on uh, my way of thinking and, uh, and my opportunity because you know, I learned at an early age that that bad things happen to good people, uh, and uh, you need more than than luck, <laughs> than lineage to sort of get your way through, uh, and education certainly provided that uh, to me. And so I studied things that were interesting to me because uh, I didn't know what else to do. So I was always good at math, but I uh, but I took history of all things, uh, and uh, and it helped me understand the context uh, and the reason why things are the way they are. It helped me to think. It helped me to appreciate things more. I think I, I learned a lot about gratitude uh, and about uh, service and about the fact that all of us enjoy uh, the sacrifice and the works of those who came before us, even people we don't know. Uh, and I think that's uh, something that's really important to me now as a leader, as I, as I think about my own work and the obligation that I have to those uh, who, uh, who follow me and found my way into the, uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Finance in the province of British Columbia. I was the uh, co-op uh, student assistant to the co-op student uh, to the junior analyst uh, role. My desk was in the hall. Uh, I, I literally started at the bottom there and, uh, and uh, worked my way up to becoming the, uh, the, the youngest and first uh, woman uh, deputy minister of finance for the province of British Columbia. And it was interesting. I also also was uh, was because I was the youngest and a woman. Also had um, uh, my son uh, was pregnant with my son uh, while I was the uh, deputy, and there was no maternity leave for deputy ministers because none had ever needed one before. 
So one of the legacies, so I had to write my own maternity leave policy uh, in order to be, it's, it's like, yeah, it's so bizarre. <laughs> yeah, like I'm not that old. It wasn't that long ago uh, that, uh, that, that I had to do that. So it's, it always is striking to me how many barriers, uh, like the, those, you know, we call them those micro barriers that add up to things that are so get in the way and so easily stop uh, the, uh, the, the progress uh, of otherwise uh, very uh, um, high potential and, and frankly, people that we need in, uh, in our economy and uh, in leadership roles to bring, the, uh, to bring that perspective. So anyway, worked uh, uh, from there. I really liked finance because yeah. from my point of view, um, uh, how, uh, how you allocate capital, you think about what industry gets money and what doesn't, who gets a loan to the small business a point of Joyce's story or not, you know, if we give a loan to a small local business versus a multinational, it has a fundamentally different effect on that community and the future of that community. So always been fascinated with that, worked my way up to, uh, to lead the country's largest uh, credit union and along the way, navigated the financial crisis and a bunch of other things, which I'm happy to tell you about at, at some point. First woman to be the CEO of, uh, of Van City in its 70 year history. And then also then got the uh, opportunity, I think after really building a, a leadership team at, uh, at Van City, very happy that the, um, my successor is also uh, a woman at Van City uh, Credit Union the first time in 40 years that a, uh, an internal candidate has been uh, promoted to CEO in that, uh, in that organization. So I feel quite good about the work that I did there. And then the opportunity to cross train, you know, to come to a sector that shares the same values that I share. You know, if we're gonna work hard, we spend, we spend the same amount of, my grandmother used to always say, you spend the same number of hours at work, whether you hate it or it's something that's really meaningful to you and drives benefit for the people and the communities you care about. So you may as well do the latter, uh, not the former. And, and I've always, she was a coal miner's daughter and I've always taken that uh, advice uh, to heart. And so uh, I've been all about leading organizations uh, that have a purpose uh, that's beyond just the bottom line. And, and here in the aviation and the airport sector, uh, I, I mean, we see it every day, right? Uh, there's no, there's no, not a single vaccine that comes to the province of British Columbia that doesn't come through my airport. Uh, the work that we do to connect people, to be a platform for the economy, uh, for community, for connections, for growth, uh, particularly given the geography of our country, is uh, is second to none. You know, we have some challenges with respect to uh, climate and uh, growth and things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's a it's a very very important and I think quite people centered business. Uh, and while the planes are cool, like I'm as nerdy as the next person, uh, the uh, the the actual the people um, are what attracted me to this role, and uh, and they're the things that uh, that that keep me focused on making sure that we have an aviation sector that can be uh, healthy and committed and do all the things that we know we need to do for our economy and our communities uh, coming out of the pandemic. Oh, what a story. Uh, the people, boy, the people in aviation, and this is this is one of the heartbreaking things about the people leaving right now, but with you know hope that it's all gonna come back together, is that the people are so passionate that work in aviation. And um, you know, before we get too much further along that route though, I just wanna go back for one second about um, when you're talking about both of you mentioned math. And so when we're talking about uh, you're growing up, and Joyce, you talked about, um, you know, the teachers and the guidance counselors that really uh, noticed you and led you and helped you in a, in a direction. Um, do you guys think that the schools right now uh, could still use some more help teaching about aviation and guiding their students to aviation? And, and how much do you think that guidance counselors matter and what some of the kids go into? I'll just start and I'm sure Tamara, you'll have a lot to add to this, but I think absolutely, right? So I have three children all in their 20s now. I laughed out loud, Tamara, when you mentioned the story about writing the <laughs> writing the policy on mat leave is two of my um, children are twins and I'll never forget the day I told my male boss that I was pregnant with twins, to which he looked at me like stone sort of cold face and said, oh, my God, does that mean you get twice as long maternity leave? <laughs> if 
if only. <laughs> if only. <laughs> and at the time, maternity leave was, I think, three months. So he was worried I was going to have uh, six months. So uh, back to, yeah, back to the um, the schools is when I think about those, my, my children, certainly if it wasn't for me, and none of them are in aviation, unfortunately, but if it wasn't for me being able to provide them with the background that I had coming through with it, my twins were only three when I joined the airport, is they would have had no idea. People still, and I know you're probably going to ask us, like, really, what is it you do? People still have no idea of what these careers are and how they can perhaps get uh, involved. And so we can't do enough, uh, just generally for anyone in the career, but for women in particular. And I think it starts at a very early age. I think it starts in the high school um, and perhaps even even younger. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Just, to, just to add to that, I uh, absolutely believe that we need greater literacy among uh, people who are advising young people around careers. They just don't even know how to describe them, I don't think, in, in my experience. And uh, so there's definitely some education and advocacy work that we can do for those who are uh, advising uh, in terms of the breadth, depth, scope of, uh, of our sector and what it actually means. And I do think the people-centered point is important uh, to the next generation. I know whether it's young men or young women, they're, they're fairly demanding about the world that they've inherited and the one that they want to create. And uh, our sector, I think sometimes really, people don't really understand it. And what I say is, you, you know, aviation isn't the enemy carbon is. And so we have to make sure that, that, that people understand uh, our business, because I think there's a there's a, a block there uh, on a number of levels. And then when it comes to math, just a, a small point on math, because I was not singled out in high school for my math ability. So unlike yeah. Joy, I think she was probably a little bit better there than I was, but I was always very good at language. And uh, if I could do something again in another life, I would teach math uh, and I would teach it as a language because it really is a language. That's all it is. And what's great about it is it's a universal language and that it has the ability to unite us and allow us to communicate in ways that uh, written and spoken language don't always uh, do. But um, people will say to me to this day, you know, you have a history degree. How can you, I kind of have a reputation for having an eagle eye. Like how, how can you read a spreadsheet like that? I said, because it tells me a story. Uh, and every time I can tell the story of a business or an issue, um, based uh, based on it. So I think there's a whole different orientation that will welcome uh, a diverse group of, uh, of people that includes uh, occasionally women into math and understanding how to use the tools of math for whatever that career is, uh, aviation being one of them. Wow. Yeah, well, I wish you were my teacher back then. <laughs> Like, yeah, so I'm an air traffic controller and everyone thinks that you have to be strong in math to be an air traffic controller. And I always say, you know, don't let that scare you away because there's creativity that's in air traffic control and, and other areas of aviation as well. So um, as much as we try to encourage people to, to go and educate themselves in math and science, you know, also don't be afraid to come into aviation if you feel like that's, you're, you know, you're not strong in physics. It's okay. That's not what we mean by, by math sometimes in a lot of these careers. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, I just want to move on to our next sort of session, which is the business, which Joyce, you, you said it, and I'm going to ask it. What do you two do? <laughs> so you're a CEO. I had a student once, um, I was doing a summer camp for NAV Canada. And the kids were there and our CEO, Neil Wilson, came in and one of the kids said, do you just sit up with your feet on your big desk one day? I want to be CEO because I want a big desk. And he laughed and he was so gracious about it. So um, who wants to start? Uh, Tamara, do you want to start on this one? What, what's the role of the CEO at the airport out in Vancouver? And then we'll ask Joyce, you know, what's that look like in Halifax? Yeah, so certainly, uh, certainly we have, uh, you know, on any uh, on any given uh, any given year pre pandemic, you know, we had 27, 28 million uh, people uh, come through our airport and uh, in many ways, uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm the subject of 27 or 27 million different bosses right and so they uh, I actually do what they uh, they need us uh, to do in terms of moving 
the organization to uh, ultimately serve our passengers and uh, and our community. So that's the first thing. CEO roles really aren't leadership roles, they're service roles. <laughs> and whether you're serving a shareholder, uh, whether you're serving a community, uh, whether you're serving a customer base uh, or whether you're serving with your, your staff, they are ultimately uh, about service. And so every day, uh, what does my typical day look like? Well, nothing's typical these days. As you can see, I am uh, in the office. Uh, and so mostly what I do is, uh, is help uh, make decisions and set people up for success. So it's a super diverse role. You know, it's everything from uh, people issues one day to finance issues the others, to thinking creatively about what our business needs could be in the future, to solving problems, to speaking and advocating uh, for uh, our industry and, and everything in between. But if there's one word that I think really summarizes uh, a CEO, um, it's actually not leader. Um, it's, uh, it's service. Uh, we, we, exist, uh, we exist to serve. Um, I will say that, that when I get together with other, and I don't know if this has been your experience as well, Joyce, but when I get together with other CEOs, the, the, from any industry. Uh, normally the conversation ultimately, because it's kind of a safer environment, um, because CEO can be kind of a lonely job too. And service can be, you're left to your thoughts to think about how best to serve um, because of the accountability. But uh, when you get together with the group, it's often kind of a nice trusted environment, right? Just like being, just like being the only women that work <laughs> in a particular company or, uh, and you get together because you have a common experience, CEOs actually, uh, I find, do the same. And the topic always comes down to this. You know, these jobs would be so much easier if it weren't for the people. <laughs> so they really are people, uh, people jobs. All the decisions that are hairy and difficult to make end up coming to the CEO because they would have been made by somebody else before they got to you if they were easy. So a lot of what we do is actually about navigating through relationships and people in service of our business and ultimately the value that we're trying to uh, create. So far from the stereotype of Wall Street and flashy cars and desks and, uh, and all of that, it, it's really actually quite a humble role day to day and is really about service uh, and, uh, and about people. Wow, Joyce, what do you think? You agree with that? Well said. It's funny because I used to get this question a lot um, when I first came into the role, especially from people who, you know, would come to the airport, catch a flight and go on their vacation and then, you know, come back and they'd say, okay, so you work for Air Canada? No, don't work for Air Canada, work for the airport authority. Oh, so you work for the government. No, don't work for the government. So then I started to describe it, and I hear you laugh because I'm sure you get that at NAV Canada. Then I, sh I started to describe it, um, that it was a, a, a bit like being the mayor of a town. And so when you think about coming to the airport, uh, you turn off the highway, you drive, the roads you drive on, we're responsible to maintain and plow and all of that, the lights we provide, you get into uh, you're driving in your car, say you park in the parkade, we run that parkade, you make your way transitioning into the terminal building, we run the terminal building. So everything you see in there is going to be ultimately managed by the airport authority through contractual relationships with others. You check into your flight, of course, that is the space that we provide in, in collaboration and coordination with our airlines. You go through security, we work really uh, carefully with uh, CATSA to ensure your screening process is as comfortable as it can be and as short as it can be. You get into the Perfect. whole room, you want to make sure, yeah, we want to make sure you can buy a burger, have a nice glass of wine, all of that we provide in coordination with our, you know, our clients. Uh, when you catch your flight, you know, NAV Canada comes in as a significant partner to ensure that our operations on our airfield is going as absolutely smoothly as they can. Until you're, you know, five kilometers away, we're thinking about you to Deborah's point or to Tamara's point, sorry, every step along the way. And so a mayor in running all of that, when you think about the community and you think about Halifax Stanfield, um, for those um, in your audience who may be from Nova Scotia, would be the size of the community here would be about the size of the town of Kentville. So 5,600 people work here, again, pre-pandemic. And so it would be similar to running a facility like that. 
if I take it to the next level, and I think about the service that you just talked about, uh, Tamara, is, um, you know, and then I thought it's so much more than that. It's so much more than the mayor of this town. So you, when you add into that the economic development that we can help achieve for our province, our, you know, our city, our province, our country, um, around tourism, around trade, immigration. I mean, the airport really does play a really significant role in all of that. And so it's working with all the stakeholders and partners beyond the passenger flight, but your cargo relationships, all of the tenants up the hangar line, your tourism agencies here on your business development um, in the province, you know, the immigration officials, you know, I often say we're the new Pier 21. Everyone knows in Halifax and, and hopefully across the country what Pier 21 is and, and uh, we've become the new Pier 21. So when you're immigrating, hopefully to Nova Scotia, you know, we are where you arrive and we want to have that sense of place. We want to present ourselves as representing our region. And so when we started to think about it in terms of economic development, again, all pre-COVID, such a significant contributor to the province. And as CEO, you get to play a role in all of that. You control very little of it in an airport, sadly. You try and influence uh, as much as you can. That's where the relationships that Tamara mentioned uh, come into play. And uh, work with the great employees that work here as part of your team to you know, move the needle on, on the economic development side and provide that one wonderful, wonderful passenger experience uh, at the same time. So it is a lot of work, um, but it is extremely rewarding. I wouldn't, you know, I always say I've got the best job in, in the province for sure. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, and that's another a common thread with aviation. I've talked to hundreds, maybe thousands of people in aviation, and almost all of them will tell you they have the best job. Like, is, isn't that fantastic that people who are in it are so passionate about it. Hey, uh, side note, as a passenger going through Halifax Airport, my favorite thing is the lobster. <laughs> you can stop right there, or you used to. I haven't been through in a, in a number of years, but uh, you used to go and pick up your lobster. And oh, and you still can't, well, not today, but with COVID, but yes, we got featured once in a magazine that was around, you know, the, the kind of coolest things you can buy at an airport around the world. And there was somebody with their little pack of live lobster getting That's on awesome. a flight at Halifax Stanfield. Yeah, no, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. We, we ship it in cargo. Many, many tons of it all over the world, but you can also just take it on your flight and enjoy it when you get to your destination. Like, yes, which I love. I'm a maritimer. So, okay, so let's talk about COVID for a minute. So you two have very different perspectives, I think, as far as, uh, you know, Joyce, you've been in it for a long time and as in this role and, you know, COVID came in. And Tamara, you came in on your white horse riding in to, to, in the middle of COVID, basically. Um, Wow, brave, I must say, and I think it, it's it's amazing. So um, maybe Joyce, let's start with you to get that perspective, and then and then here Tamara is sort of just starting this new job in the middle of the pandemic, which is incredible. So yeah, like I, yeah, where, what are the effects? <laughs> I was taking note of Tamara's comment that I was one of the first folks to reach out. And I remember thinking, you're sure you're joining now? So thrilled that another woman was joining. Um, but yes, in the middle of in, in the middle of the pandemic. And so you're right. Um, when I came into my role in 1999 as VP Finance, I mean, one of the things I want to leave with the audience is just the importance of putting yourself out there, to be honest. And so one of the things I wanted to do early on is get some, op as I said, I had no aviation experience, get some operational experience, obviously, as VP finance saw that side of the role, but what can I do from an operations side? So I signed up for, um, for EOC managers. So this is our emergency operations um, center put my name on the roster, train me, I want to be a manager. And so I was quite happy to do that um, and had been through some, uh, a couple of exercises that we all do and then a few live events, um, which is sort of wonderful training. And then 9-11 hit. And so in 2011 or 2001, which is, I'd been maybe just over two years working at the airport, 9-11 um, happens. And I happened to be on the roster for 
um, the EOC manager through that. And so you want to talk about kind of learning the business. And I, and I have to say, um, Kendra, I would have thought that nothing, you know, would hit the sector any harder than that until until now. So, you know, you learn a lot from 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 events such as that, world events, and obviously you come out the other side so much stronger and better um, than you were before. Um, you know, some great, uh, when I think about the measures that came as a result of 9-11, we've all seen them in the industry, you know, sort of what I call curb to gate, the different processes that, that have uh, have been implemented since for the security and safety of us all. Obviously, the same thing will happen uh, with the pandemic. And although, you know, we had SARS, we had the financial crisis in 2008 that Tamara mentioned, um, this is one resilient sector, I have to tell you, and it's been through a lot. It certainly has not been through anything like uh, COVID, but I feel fairly confident we will come out the other side. It's um, probably going to get worse before it gets better. And, um, you know, you mentioned, I think somebody mentioned either perhaps you, Kendra or Tamara, you know, the people in the business and everyone saying they love it. And I have to say, um, I just couldn't be more um, inspired by um, watching the sector respond to this event. And, um, you know, so many good people have lost their employment and hopefully someday we'll be back, but um, we'll be stronger and we'll be better as a result of that. So certainly the organization here at Halifax Stanfield, and I know with the work of CAC across the country, everybody is, um, is working really hard to you know to sort of um, figure out the other side of this but uh, yeah it's been a significant challenge and and one that I'm so grateful to have somebody like Tamara in our sector because um, somebody new in in that role um, certainly causes as an industry us to you know to think uh, differently about the steps we take and how we you know how we prepare ourselves and and you know what our next you know what this is going to look like obviously very different on the other side so yeah it's um it's a very interesting time to be in the sector there's no question about that yeah so tamara like you you caught you came into aviation in the middle like the ceo of an airport in the middle of the pandemic but with you and this is why i sort of joke about coming in on your white horse and saving the day sort of things because you're bringing this just breath of experience with you that can can tend to anything but help the airport um so what what has it been like must be yeah. a little different <laughs> it's been a little it's it's been a little different uh for sure so as i as i mentioned i uh i joined uh, uh van city which uh, at that, that point was a you know a, a regional 10 billion dollar a financial institution right on the eve of the financial uh, crisis and still saw some value in uh, in going through that and at the time we thought that was the single biggest like we haven't seen anything in a generation uh, uh, that that uh, big um, and managed to navigate and and really uh, take the organization I think in a different direction quite proud of uh, being able to, it's like a $30 billion organization now and quite uh, committed uh, to, uh, to, to values-based banking. Um, and so I was on the board of uh, YBR uh, as the representative for the city of Vancouver, um, the nominee for nine years. So I understood the airport and its value. And I certainly uh, um, understood it from both an economic and uh, and just a passenger's point of view, right? Like I always say to our folks here, nobody builds an airport as an end unto itself. Why would you do that? You know, an airport exists for the sole purpose of serving our community and the economy that supports it. And so I always knew that it was super important. Uh, and then, uh, then I'd been at Van City for 13 years and could, certainly could have been there for another 10, like it was, uh, it was doing quite well. Uh, but I also think that CEOs, you know, CEOs are a little bit like bad house guests, like they don't ever <laughs> quite know when to leave, you know, they always stay on a little bit too long. And so I had this great next generation leadership team that I had built at, uh, at Van City. And at some point, I just kind of had to get out of the way. So for 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 a while, I, I had been uh, thinking about a change, but frankly, nothing had I had lots of very fortunate I had lots of opportunity and, and frankly offers but nothing really spoke to me like this one even in a knowing completely wide-eyed and to Joyce's point the board of directors said to me the chair said to me 
like literally on the day I was finally signing the contract in April, she said, are you sure? <laughs> and I said, absolutely, I'm sure. And even with everything we've been through, even since then, I would do not regret that for a minute. I'd make exactly the same decision again. Why? Because I couldn't believe I got the opportunity to do this once in my career, let alone twice. But when you think about it, it's not very many times that you get an opportunity, in this case, a forced one, to take a couple of steps back and look at a whole entire business like that is like a small city, as, uh, as Joyce said, from end to end and think about what it needs to do to take that next step forward. And frankly, a lot of the things that we're now addressing were already present prior to the pandemic, uh, whether it was, whether it was um, you know, uh, how, we, how we curate our passenger experience and the need to digitize, whether it was uh, thinking about the multimodal connectivity and how we work there, whether we're thinking about using technology to more efficiently run uh, our business, whether we were relying in our case too much on uh, international uh, travel from China in particular and whether that would keep growing uh, double digits uh, uh, going forward, and whether we were doing enough on the cargo side, not only just to increase the amount of uh, cargo that we carry in terms of volume, but it's a super important point from an access point. Are where we creating enough points of access, just like we think about routes, enough points of access for the business community that absolutely needed us to, in order to make the supply chain actually, uh, actually work. Uh, and so all of that has simply been accelerated uh, by, the, by the pandemic. And so I do not wish, don't misunderstand me, I would never wish a pandemic on anyone. Uh, and I don't mean to minimize the severe effects that's had on people's lives, including losing their lives in some cases. But in, when it comes to an opportunity to really look at a business and think about how it needs to be transformed to be more resilient in the future, the requirement to look at everything has been, uh, has been a gift. And, and am I bullish on our future? I absolutely am. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see opportunity that we knew was there before, but frankly, the passengers kept coming and the flights kept coming. So we didn't really have to deal with it because, uh, because the revenue was coming in. Now we do. And uh, people are counting on us for all the reasons we said at the beginning, not the least of which are the people that rely on us uh, for their employment uh, so they can you know, feed their families and, uh, and have, a, have a, a healthy life. And then all of the businesses that rely on us and the sectors and ultimately, the functioning uh, of our of our country. So I see huge opportunity, uh, and uh, I, I, tr I truly feel quite uh, quite lucky uh, to be in this role at this time. We're just looking at our incentive payments, which are of course zero, uh, and uh, and and so there are. It does come with some hard reality, uh, but we have employment, right? And we have the opportunity to steer an entire, in our case, when we're fully up, twenty six thousand people. Uh, and and the work going forward, and and I'm quite I'm quite humbled by the opportunity to lead that. Wow, wow. Well, I'm glad that it sounds like there's a sense of a, a you know an excitement about the future, even though it's really tough right now. We have to get through right now, but there's also like an excitement about the future and and the potential of aviation that's going to happen in what two or more years from now as as it rebuilds and grows, and and it'll be interesting to see what new jobs come out of it. Um, we do have a question that um, someone wants to ask you, uh, and I don't know how much you can talk about this. Will airports need federal aid to remain active while there is a 90 to 95 percent loss in traffic? Yes. <laughs> how about that? Um, so for sure, I mean, there's there is a loss. So that's a very interesting uh, question. And there is a loss in business of, you know, 90 to 95%. And so we are no different than any other, you know, private business. We do not um, get revenue from the government to uh, allow us to operate. So all the, the uh, business I explained earlier, um, uh, the various touch points is all part of our business. So in Halifax Stanfield's case, you know, we would normally be a 100 plus, obviously Tamara's would be many times this, but 100 million plus annual uh, revenue generator. 
and um, that is down to a trickle and has been for a very long time. So, you know, depending on the various uh, financial positions, because we're all independent, um, that the airports are heading into the sector, um, they are, you know, liquidity has become no different than the air carriers really, really key. And uh, it's very important for those organizations to very carefully manage that liquidity. Uh, pretty well, every airport, um, for sure, and the large airports across Canada are today uh, borrowing basically to stay open. And you can only run a business for so long on traffic, traffic numbers like that. So um, they're definitely is lots of dialogue with the federal government for support. We're grateful for the support um, that has been received to date. Um, things like the queues program and um, the reduction in ground lease rent that uh, some of the airports uh, will uh, have to pay is great, uh, but so much more than that is needed. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting over the next year to watch. And and see what happens. Um, I have another question here and uh, oh, we're running out of time and we have so many more questions that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, here's a good one though. And uh, I wanna say thanks for this question. This is actually from a lovely lady that uh, I'm in a mentor relationship with, a mentee mentor relationship with. She says, thank you so much for this talk today. So inspiring. What was the steepest learning curve or obstacle that you had to adapt when you stepped into your roles of CEO that you weren't initially prepared for? Something jump out to either one of you? I think you narrow it to one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think if I had to say one thing, it's the power of the CEO's credit card. What does that mean? Oh. Well, the fact that the fact that everything you do um, is suddenly a symbol of something. <laughs> and even if it's like, I don't know, scratching your head in a meeting, oh, did you see that? That means she really doesn't like that. You're like, what? Um, and also everything you say is, is in a context. So when I say CEO's credit card, the number of times people would say, well, you know, Tamara says blah, blah, blah. And then it'd come back to me. I'm like, why are you doing that? They said, well, so-and-so said, I said, I never said that. Like, and so every, every, um, and what it was, was an interpretation of something that I didn't intend. So that, that, that a sudden realization that, uh, that you are in the spotlight fishbowl uh, in ways that just as a human being, <laughs> you probably uh, can't, uh, can't uh, really predict um, is something that I think anybody who's been a CEO uh, learns over time. Uh, and, in, uh, and then at the same time, still wanting to be myself and authentic to my journey, my story, who I am, people, the feedback I get, probably the feedback, honestly, that I'm most proud, like, you know, it's great to get awards and to achieve business results. I, I am, uh, uh, you know, I am uh, motivated by that, uh, at least in part. But the things that uh, personally uh, make the biggest difference to me is, as I said, when we can do something that really helps someone really, truly. And when people tell me, uh, you know, uh, I'm the same person uh, when I meet the prime minister or, uh, or when I meet uh, one of our contracted cleaners uh, who work to keep our airport washrooms clean every day. I'm the same Tamara, talk the same way. They say uh, uh, I'm the same person. So that's quite important to me personally. And being able to navigate that, uh, knowing that, you know, I'm the first woman. So if I screw it up, I'll screw it up. They'll say it was because I was a woman and all those people behind me will have to suffer because of it. Um, being being true to, to my roots and my beliefs while knowing that everybody's watching everything, uh, honestly is, uh, is, a, is a, uh, was probably the most unexpected uh, and uh, biggest adjustment that I had to make. Everything else, I was kind of, I kind of got used to you know, being treated differently, being the only woman in a group of men and uh, suddenly them all looking at you going, what would women think about this? I'm like, well, how would I possibly know what women would think about that? I don't represent all women. <laughs> but those kinds of things I had encountered more along the way, but certainly not uh, that everything you do is, uh, is seen and visible and then really uh, having to appreciate that and still stay true to yourself. Um, was the biggest uh, learning here. Okay, and th th that's great. Thank you. Uh, Joyce, how about you? And it, it's very interesting because you were in the same company and then mm -hmm. moved into that CEO role. So a little bit. So, 
I'll echo a comment Tamara made later that stuck out for me when you read that question out was the loneliness part. So that probably was the biggest adjustment because of exactly what you just said. Um, Kendra is being in an organization where you're a member of a senior team um, with your colleagues and then you moving into the role as CEO, you've lost that, you've lost that relationship. So it is quite lonely at the top and you very much uh, I very much rely on the relationships with other CEOs, but that was probably the biggest adjustment for me. Wow. I've heard that. And, and so you saying that is is, is so powerful. Um, one thing I really want to know is how do you deal with your stress? Like you have the, the big vision, of course, your CEOs, you have to have a big vision. And then you have your own internal issues that you deal with on a, on a, on a daily basis or on a minute basis or whatever. Like, so how do you, how do you deal with that stress while, while continuing to keep the whole thing moving forward and whoever wants to answer first? <laughs> I'll be quick. I'll just say my family keeps me grounded. So for sure, my mom, who's, I'm so fortunate to still have living. She's I get her age wrong and she hears this, she'll be upset. So 87, <laughs> she's still going to be upset that I disclose that. Um, my, you know, my, my, my siblings, I mentioned one of four, my spouse been with me through it all. And uh, my now sort of in their twenties kids who very much kind of keep me grounded uh, from the stress. So if I, you know, if I think about, especially through COVID, the time that you need to get away from the stress, it's very limited now. You can't go off and do much outside, or I guess you can a bit. So still try and do some of that, at least here in Nova Scotia. We still have our ski hills and stuff like that open. But but the family time is 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 key for me. That's the most important thing for me. Oh, well, that's nice. Tamara? Yeah, and my, mine would be the same, right? I, I have a very, I'm very lucky to have a very supportive spouse and son and my parents are both alive. And actually, I have my grandmother is, uh, wow. is, uh, is still alive. So I feel quite lucky. And they all, they all put it into perspective. You know, we have a saying that emerged in one unfortunate incident that I'll tell on a different webinar, but uh, as emerged in our house that uh, my son and my, my husband use sometimes with increased uh, frequency, you know, Tamara or mom, you're not the CEO of everything. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, it, it, it kind of reminds you to put things in perspective, right? And yeah, it keeps me uh, grounded, my feet on the ground, humble, understanding what's really, uh, what's really uh, important. And it allows me to, uh, to, to manage the, the pressure and the, the accountability of the decisions that I do have to make. So except for your family, so taking your family out of this next question, what is the thing when you look back that you are the most proud of? If you had to pick one, I mean, you've both won a lot of awards and, and recognition was, you know, was it that or was it, was it something else? I can, you know, I'm just going to tell you the one that just came to mind because I think that's often a good, I'm not going to filter it too much for you. Um, uh, uh, I remember, uh, there was a, uh, there was a, a young woman that was, uh, was, uh, working for us at the credit union and she was great. She was going through a tough time and, uh, she, uh, ended up, um, uh, ended up, uh, breaking some of our policies, frankly, uh, because she ended up looking up the finances of her deadbeat extra spouse who was not paying child support and creating quite a few uh, issues uh, for her and her family that were quite horrific. And, uh, and she had left an abusive relationship and she was quite public about that. And she'd been a, a real leader in our, uh, in our organization, but yet, you know, those, there's privacy rules and you can't break them. So it doesn't matter why you break them. Uh, you, you can't work uh, for us anymore uh, when you do that. Um, and that was very hard uh, because the context in which that decision came was one that uh, I felt tremendous empathy for, frankly. And, and, and uh, I was quite um, uh, truly proud of the fact that I had enough of a relationship, enough of an open culture that she came to me and told me, you know, what's really important was that she wanted to use this to um, go back to school. She had never actually graduated from grade 12 and she wanted to be, uh, uh, of all things now, a, a long-term care 
uh, support worker. And so we were able to negotiate um, uh, through my, my contacts for her to be able to do that. Um, and she wrote to me and she graduated and she was successful. Of course she was, she was great at it. And, and uh, for me, those things really make a difference, right? Being, being able to, being able to um, make a difference in somebody's life using the power that you have absolutely in a way that's accountable for the big accountabilities you have, but also negotiating it in a human way. Um, you know, that's what I want for my kids <laughs> and for my community. Uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm you know, I, I feel good about the fact that I was able to do the right thing in, in both ways, um, in a way that was a bit unconventional. But uh, but still, ultimately, was true to uh, to what I believe in. Oh, that's so good, Joyce. Funny because I was thinking that's a great story, Tamara. But I was thinking about I don't know if pride is the right word here for this. But when I was appointed in 2014 to the role of CEO, I had never thought, and therefore had significantly underestimated what that meant to what it meant to have an internal promotion to the employees here. And I was just really um, kind of humbled and taken back by the response to that internally. Our CEOs prior to that had all been externally appointed. And so it sort of told me almost instantly, you know, the power of being able to do that and being in an organization that it's important to do that succession planning and it's important to to um, you know work with the team you have to ensure you are developing them professionally. I was totally uh, taken aback by the response on a positive uh, perspective from the team here. Everyone was so proud of me and I was like, well, you know, geez, I don't know, I might not have got the job. It was just, you know, was 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 great that I went through the process and very happy that I did, but just, yeah, really taken back by that. I, I often think back to that moment. Wow. You guys, I have so many more questions. I wish we were here for another five hours because I literally have a list of questions that I didn't even get to. But um, in closing, we have about a minute left. What advice would you give to the women who are watching this and they want to be you or something else? No, you don't. They want to no, be don't. something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hear you there. That was worth it all. But they, they want to grow their career. Right. And they're and they're like, how how do I get to the next step? Or they have that negative voice inside their head, you know, excuse my language here, but I call mine Pillsbury Doe Bitch uh, because she's so negative and I've had to learn how to control her. Um, and, it, you know, whether it's themselves stopping them from getting to the next step or or they're just lost and don't know what to do. What advice would you leave people that are in that position that, that, that just want to grow their career and they're just lost? I'm going to give some quick snappers and then Tamara, yeah. you'll probably add the same. I mean, kind of stay true to yourself, right? Never underestimate the power of um, trying to help out, you know, in your role. So when I think about my role as VP finance and just whatever I could do, you know, for the management team and the CEO at the time and the board, I, I just I just wanted to do. We were kind of in it together. Um, and, you know, I don't know who the audience is, but Absolutely. If you're even thinking about a career in aviation, despite the pandemic right now, um, just go for it. Just keep, you know, and, and don't give up if you're not successful. So, you know, the part I didn't talk about is the applications I did that didn't result in me getting that next position, mm -hmm. which ultimately still led to where I am today. And, you know, we're for the right reasons. So just pick yourself up and keep going. That's a really important part. To, mm -hmm. to apply even if you fail right like mm -hmm. people look at you and think oh she's never failed at anything in her life mm -hmm. maybe that's not true yeah no tamara yeah i uh those are excellent uh joyce and i i agree with them particularly the being true to yourself it's not I, i'll tell you this uh in my observation uh of 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 others and even some Ooh. of the choices that i've been faced with like it's just not worth it if it's not you um, the other, so be authentic. And then the other, the other thing is, it's a sign of strength, not weakness, to ask for help. And I think this is we got this whole thing wrong about you're weak if you ask for help. Quite the opposite. I was always struck by the generosity 
of people uh, around me who, when I said, I, I can't figure this out, could you help? Or how do you balance being a mom and an executive? Like, I have no idea how to do that. And uh, how generous people are, uh, um, truly. Of course, there's a couple that weren't, but honestly, like a handful out of thousands. Uh, so ask for help. Um, there's wisdom in so many places. Um, we just have to uh, just put ourselves out there and, and ask for it. Wow. Thank you both so much. Uh, like, thank you for letting us into your lives and uh, learning more about you and your journey and, and, and how you got where you are and, and how you how you deal with the stress. That's a big one. Um, so thank you so much to you both. I, I really appreciate it. I thank everyone for watching or wherever you're watching. Thank you so much. Um, if you're on Zoom here, I did put the link into our masterclass that's coming up on leadership. It's again, it's five sessions. Uh, you, you get to have conversations like this and dive in even deeper and have some round table discussions. So look at that. If you want to be in aviation, if you're looking for a mentor, if you're in aviation and you want to sort of figure out how to create, uh, you know, the journey in your life to the next step and you need a mentor, contact us as well. We have all kinds of mentors or if you want to be a mentor, again, it's elevateaviation.ca. Thank you for joining us. And to you two again, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to maybe one day actually uh, having a glass of wine in person someplace yeah. where we can actually see each other in person. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay.